Um, I want to thank all the speakers for a very inspiring day. And this is one of the most inspiring tasks I've had in a long time to try to summarize these. And um, we've heard a lot of statistical modelers, mostly from the background of, of psychology, where these models are, are implemented. And let's try to see how these could be uh, implemented in, in educational designs. So where do we go from here? and uh, discuss the synergies between methodologies and research in, in education and wrapping up the, the things we have heard today. So we must acknowledge first that there is a strong synergy between innovations in research methodology and substantive research questions in educational research. And um, what we have heard here today could work in one of, of two ways that we, we can pose after today, substantive new research questions uh, by using, by, by creating new methodologies. We've heard many examples of those methodologies today. Or then we can take the methodologies we have heard today and uh, creatively in our mind pose new research questions. Aha, with this method we can understand some new phenomenon and uh, that would assist us in designing studies in a new way. So thinking before we go and um, seeing um, uh, this is an iterative process through the history of science that methodology and research questions have fed into each other. Just think of the development of the factor analytical technique and the understanding of the different factors of, of human intelligence that came out of this cross-fertilization in, uh, over the, in, in history. Um, I pinpoint uh, at least four themes today, but um, I'll first talk about the role of time. We've talked about ordinal time or continuous time, uh, the role of uh, hierarchical structures. We've seen examples of time points in persons in higher order units, which is very relevant from an educational point of view where we typically have students nested in, in classrooms in the classical school effectiveness model. Um, thirdly, we have the distinction between variable and person-oriented methods. Um, uh, I illustrate that with the distinction between a factor and two clusters from Bauer and Curran. We know that the same correlational data, if we analyze it as correlational structure, we can extract one factor. If we then analyze the mean structure, we can have the number of factors plus, plus one. Uh, but we look at different aspects of the, the data. And finally, uh, from the final talk, but also interspersed with the other speakers who used simulated data, simulate first, um, simulate before you go. And uh, um, so let's first of all move away from black box models of educational processes, um, uh, like the ones where the lear process, lear learning process is a complex uh, of various motives and strategies where this is not spelt out and uh, not using uh, longitudinal data for understanding processes in time. Moving away from that type of theoretical model, we can see time as a key factor for educational uh, processes and referring to, to Bernard Schmitz, uh, uh, process is a sequence of states over time, and um, th this could, um, th the, the types of studies we have heard today is starting off with Asko Tolvanen, talked about longer term longitudinal studies, where I think the task focused behaviors was measured on a yearly basis or twice a year, uh, half year interval, is, isn't that correct? half a year in between. So kind of a longer term longitudinal study. The, the same methodologies can then be used for shorter term intensive longitudinal studies like we saw with uh, Folkless and, and Hamaker studies. And in between we have studies of, of diary data on a daily or, or weekly basis. Um, what we could think of in, in future designs would be so-called burst studies with repeated shorter term intensive longitudinal data. Uh, there are not many studies where we have intensive diaries, but repeated, say, every half year or every year or so. That could be a next, uh, like the, um, the, the Helsinki CAS 
study of university students has this design, but um, I don't think the, that burst design has yet been, been published, but um, that work is in progress on that front. The studies could be designed in that uh, way. The important questions to ask when we are looking for uh, processes in education is that uh, are the learning processes stable or changing over time? And how instruction could have an influence on these learning processes? So somehow incorporating the contextual factors and the uh, human interaction in those learning situations. And this could be accomplished with many of the models we have heard here today. Further on the topic of, of time, I think it's important to think about the time scale when we design a study. And we've heard various time scales here, starting with uh, human development in, in years and half years. And, but human development takes place so over decades even, or as, uh, in leaps in, in months. Uh, the social organization of schools is typically organized in days, weeks, months, and, and seasonal effects. So studies could be designed to, to capture those. When we go to more specific learning situations, what is then the appropriate time span for capturing learning tasks in school? Would that be in terms of the minutes, 10 minute sessions, or hours? That means are these lessons or sections of lessons? Or how often do we measure during one, one lesson? I uh, have seen examples both from my own research where students have been asked to respond at the last 10 minutes of each lesson, at least. I've also uh, designed a study where we have three time points per lesson, beginning, middle, and end, where the right uh, number of time points and within which time span is, is yet to, to be determined, I think. If we then go deeper down into the cognitive and biological processes of learning, uh, uh, like fMRI studies and the similar, the, 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 the time spans there can be microseconds when we deal with uh, uh, kind of neurological or biological data, physiological measurements and the so. It's also possible to think of multiple time frames in the design of studies. One can have, uh, for example, physiological measurements measured within subjective reports. So subjective time is every time the experience sampler beeps, and then the physiological measure can be a continuous stream of data. And this is, for example, by Lisa Hoffman, a quite new book, The Longitudinal Analysis, suggests that one could have one uh, level of a hierarchical structure having the physiological time nested within those um, uh, subjective reports uh, over time. There's a second good book out also in intensive longitudinal methods on diary and experience sampling research. Uh, these are quite easy to grasp and start from zero. Um, the second big topic is the role of the hierarchical structure. Uh, Asendorf gave a very clear one, two, three, and four level um, uh, um, structure of this. Uh, in order to go beyond ideographic and nomothetic research, we can expand the Cattell box. And we heard some debate today. Uh, if we go, we go beyond cross-sectional data, um, uh, that was a common agreement across all the speakers, to, um, but then more on the front of, of Ellen Hamaker in intra individual analysis of one person or then a number of persons, or then we have the multi level analysis of time points uh, within persons. And this is the, the uh, structure of, uh, of Asendorf and his talk. There is one dimension missing in Cattell's cube, it is said, and this is the context in which. Uh, events take place. These contexts can be modeled either as within person variables or as um, we can have person variables as we have seen, but then the classroom context and school context would require an additional layer of hierarchical levels above those. So some suggestions on, 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 the, uh, on features to include in, in such hierarchical models and uh, guess that these are challenges for, for the dynamic um, time series models. Um, 
So the kind of aggregates that we would like to be able to include are, for example, uh, average performance or performance heterogeneity and variables such as proportion of girls and boys, the gender balance in a classroom. These can be aggregated either from the data set you have or from archive data at the school level. But these are so-called formative factors. They're based on the available information aggregated at a higher level. Other variables that are important for getting to how we can support students' interpersonal learning processes to get, for example, student ratings of classroom climate. At, that would be an aggregate at the, that would be common for all the students in the same classroom. But this poses a particular challenge uh, uh, in when student groups are complex. So students, in particular in secondary school, change group constellation when they go from one subject to the other. Well, they at the same time change teacher. So not only does the teacher change, but also the constellation of students. So what is then the, the classroom climate? You would need a climate for each of those lessons or the school subjects or the teachers. So the complex complexity of this classroom climate uh, it, it increases. Um, can um, model relationships in school? That's the other driver of, uh, of learning. Uh, uh, looking at uh, the, the, the modeling of conflicts, this could work in a school context as well. Conflict and bullying could be relevant dependent variables, but uh, we could then have other, think of other variables, either student reported or teacher reported aspects such as emotional support, instructional support, uh, student reported collaboration with other students or help seeking of the teacher. And, um, Peer groups could also be specified as a hierarchical level in its own right. So we have students nested in peer groups in classrooms or in schools. And I know that Nona Kiuru has, has modeled exactly this hierarchical structure in a paper that uh, she did not present uh, today. But that structure is also possible. A, a real challenge to, to this modeling uh, is the situation if we were able to collect data of students' uh, peer-nominated relationships within, uh, say, uh, a, a one classroom. So we could find uh, constellations such as dyads and cliques and crowds. These are dynamic structures that change from one lesson to another, probably. Or then there's a difference between these groupings in lesson time and in break time, and also in school and out of school time. So there's a complex structure of peer relations that might be possible to model with other techniques that were not presented today, such as the actor network models and integrated into models by Tom Snyder's and the Sienna software or combination, some other creative um, uh, strategy. Um, if we think of change in student learning over time. Um, here, we also have the complex structuring of uh, what relationships with teachers or teacher effects. This is from a class, cross-classified structure, as we just heard uh, um, also Kuo Murayama talk about cross-classification. If you think of uh, hierarchical structure of time points nested in students, nested in schools, then we could think of um, an alternative cross-classified structure if the students change teacher over time. So here we now have two level two structures which are cross-classified. And at, we see that the first student uh, is with teacher one at times one and two. Uh, so is the, the second student, but at the second time point, uh, the, the students have changed teacher. So there's a complex way of looking at relationships between students uh, and teachers, but you could find this same structure also in, in, in one day in a school when students change groups. So these are comp very complex structures if we want to try to, to, to capture them and model them in, in school settings. Thirdly, we uh, had an inspirational uh, introduction to the, the person-oriented method. 
And uh, we're there, people who use latent profile analysis typically want to find nonlinear relationships so that the, the, the lines in the graph cross each other to become uh, quite interesting. The, the mixture model that uh, Nona presented uh, is a creative integration of latent class analysis in what the parameter that would typically, in my mind, um, have been a random effects model. That was then that those beta coefficients were categorized into four different uh, clusters. And uh, that made it uh, then uh, um, creative and an and interesting expansion of a random effects model. Um, for educational context, uh, I see that this model could be directly applied if we have students and teachers' uh, emotions rated uh, by uh, students and teachers. This would be in a dyad analysis, like we have fathers and, and children. Then we have an additional complex layer if we have many student-teacher uh, dyads nested within each teacher, then there would be one layer above. So we would have uh, the dyad information here, here the between person level, and one could then again imagine a third level here that teachers could differ in the way they interact with certain students. And this kind of study would be interesting in my view. But complex data to collect, certainly. Finally, uh, we have seen uh, simulation studies um, flicker throughout the day. Um, this is a way to, to test uh, carefully designed tests of certain algorithms and how well they work. And then typically all the presenters showed how you take this algorithm that works well in the simulation and apply it to, to, um, uh, to, to, to a, an, an empirical sample. And so this could be a good way to go before we get too carried away by all these, these great models we have seen today. So simulate first and know before you go, because the samples are very complex, what is the desired number of observations at various levels? Will you have enough teachers in your data? So you can have a third or fourth level available. Um, check the statistical power and also very complex random effects that might be present in, in, uh, in data like this, like uh, Murayama showed in his talk. Some possible designs that um, we could um, think of are so-called ABAB or burst designs in, in education. So we have a period of intensive measurement and then we have a period of development as usual or an intervention design and then return back to an, uh, an intensive measurement period and then have an intervention period or development uh, uh, as usual. And such burst designs with intensive longitudinal measures are, are still quite uh, rare. Um, I haven't come across one as far as I'm aware in an educational context. But um, the, they are certainly in the fields of medicine and, uh, and um, dosage-based intervention. This is already something that is happening in, in medical research. Um, another design could be if all students who are part, take part of an intensive longitudinal study report on the interaction with their, their teachers at a particular time interval. And then this teacher would also, in that same time interval, report on a number of uh, target students in the classroom and the interaction with uh, those target students. Um, anecdotal information from discussions with teachers in England suggested that it would be possible for primary school teachers to report on, say, four students each sampling period. And that would be very interesting data to, to collect, I find, and that with, with enough teachers, I think it would be possible to see if there are individual differences between teachers in how they interact with students who have different characteristics. And such a study, as far as I'm aware, doesn't exist in, 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 in education yet. And then finally, 
What we haven't touched much upon today are the, um, the, to, in the incorporation of biophysiological measures that use a different time scale, like stress, activity levels, sleep patterns, uh, and the such, which then flow at the millisecond and second uh, and, and other levels that were down in the, the, the biological uh, system. And um, that's an area where we could uh, also uh, anticipate studies in the future. Okay, so um, thank you very much to the speakers. Um, I hope this gives an impetus also for the, the research students in this group and, and to also other research students and researchers out there to think of models and incorporate these in, in future designs.